All right, welcome to this lecture on the momentum equations. In a previous lecture, we talked about the continuity equation, which is just really conservation of mass for a very small control volume. Now we're going to expand to look at the momentum equations for small control volumes. Those momentum equations are called, um, when you shrink them down to a small control volume, are just still called the momentum equations. Um, so we'll have now, after this lecture, we'll have talked about conservation of mass and the momentum equations for small control volumes. In the next lecture, what we'll do is we'll use what are known as a constitutive relation, a stress-strain rate constitutive relationship. Basically, what it does is it relates stresses that we'll get in the momentum equations to velocity gradients. So we'll take that stress-strain rate constitutive relationship, plug it into the momentum equations, and then we'll end up with what's known as the Navier-Stokes equations. So that's on tap for the next lecture. But for this lecture, we'll just derive the momentum equations for a small control volume. So let's go ahead and look at the screen here. Uh, what we have, oops, let me go back up. So here in this picture, what we have is a, um, a rowing team, a rowing skull. And you can see, uh, you know, we have the rowers in here on the water. This is not an oil slick, kind of looks like an oil slick, but it's not. It's basically a, a computational fluid dynamic simulation uh, superimposed on top of this picture of what I presume is uh, probably like a, a pressure field or perhaps a velocity field that you get around the rowing skull. The colors represent probably differences in pressure, I'm going to guess. I'm not entirely sure uh, what the colors represent, but it's a computational fluid dynamics simulation that's used to analyze the flow around this rowing skull and presumably to try to optimize it in some way. As I've talked about before in other lectures, you know, computational fluid dynamics, also known as CFD, is just a numerical technique for solving the continuity equation and the Navier-Stokes equations, which are just momentum equations for Newtonian fluids. Um, it's just a, a way to do these things numerically rather than by hand. And whenever you get to some sort of complex geometry, you, you need to solve the equations numerically. It's, they're just too hard to do by hand. All right, well, let's get straight into the material. So, uh, on the screen here, what you see is a small control volume. So we've shrunk the control volume to a very small size so that it has dimensions of dx, dy, dz. So you can see our coordinate system. So this is dx, dy, and dz is out of the page. And what I've done in this picture, it looks kind of complicated, but bear with me for a moment. What I've done is I've shown all of the surface forces acting on that cube in terms of stresses in the x direction in particular. So what I'm going to do, for example, is say right at the center, the stresses there are sigma xx, sigma yx, sigma zx. Those are the stresses that point in the x direction. Remember that the stress sign convention, let me zoom in on it, the stress sign convention is the first subscript is what face the stress is acting on, and the sub second subscript tells you what direction the stress is pointing in. And so since they all have an x as the second subscript, those stresses all point in the x direction. I'm only going to worry about the x direction just for the sake of clarity. So the stresses in the center are just all given by this, these sigmas. So let me first focus on the normal stresses on the left and right faces. So the normal stress would be like a sigma xx. Okay. So we're going to go to the right face. Okay, and so the stress, the normal stress on that face, points in the x direction, is going to be sigma xx plus the sigma xx dx. So this is how that normal stress changes as I move in the x direction times a one half dx because going from the center to that face, I move a distance of one half dx. Remember the cube has a full width of dx from side to side, so when I go from the middle to the right, I only go a distance of one half dx, and it's a positive one half dx because I'm moving in the positive x direction. So this is now the normal stress in the x direction on that face. That, that's the blue uh, arrow right there. And to make that a force, we multiply that stress by an area. So the area of this face on the right-hand side will be dy times dz. So y is in that direction, z is that direction. So here's dz. Here's dy. So this is now the force due to that normal stress on the right-hand face. We can do the same idea on the left-hand face. That's this green one. So the st normal stress there will be sigma xx plus 
the sigma xx dx because it's changing as I move from the center to the left. This is that Taylor series approximation we've talked about in previous lectures. I'm making use of that here. To go from the center to the left-hand face, it's a distance of minus one-half dx. And then we multiply that whole thing, that whole stress on that face, times dy dz, because that's the area of that left face. So those are the normal stress, stress uh, forces, or the forces in the x direction due to these normal stresses. We can do the same thing, let's say, in the vertical direction. Now the stress that points in the x direction on that surface up here on the top, let's say, that'll be a sigma y x stress, because the normal vector on that top surface, let me draw a normal vector, is pointing in the y direction. So the stress we care about there is the sigma y x. It's on a y face pointing in the x direction. So it's this kind of stress here. So if the stress in the center is sigma y x, and I move upward a distance of 1 half dy in the y direction, the stress up there will be sigma y x, the stress we start with, plus how that stress varies in the y direction, because I'm now moving in the y direction as I go from the center to the top times how far I've moved to get to the top, which is a distance of 1 half dy, because I've only gone from the center to the top. And then the area of that top face will be a dx times a dz. So that's the uh, surface force in the x direction on that top face. So it's that blue surface force. And you can, of course, do the same thing on the bottom. So that, I won't go through the whole procedure there, but you can see that surface force due to that uh, stress on the bottom face. And then you can also do the front and back faces. The stresses in the front and back faces will be the sigma zx stress because it's on a z face pointing in the x direction. And all of the stresses I've drawn here are all in a positive direction. Remember from the stress sign convention, a positive stress on a positive face points in the positive direction. So the blue uh, vectors here all represent positive for surface forces on those faces because they're all on positive faces and the green ones are all positive surface forces on the negative faces okay and that just has to do with the stress sign convention so those are all the surface forces that we have acting on this little element of material um, in the x direction so now what i'm going to do is make use of newton's second law okay so F equals MA. That's exactly what I'm going to be doing. So let me just focus on the force term, right? Okay. Um, and so that's what I'm building up to here is I'm going to focus on the force term. So the, the sum of the forces in the X direction due to these surface forces, it's right here, will be all of these uh, surface forces that I've shown here. These are all the X surface forces. So I'm just going to combine them all down here, write them all out. So on the right hand face, we have this expression, that's the surface force over on the right-hand face. Left-hand face, we have this one. On the top surface, we have that one. On the bottom surface, we have that. And then we have on the uh, front face, we have this one. And on the back face, we have that one. So these are all the surface forces. And you can do the same thing in the y direction, in the z direction. But if you look at this for a moment, you'll see some terms drop out. For example, the sigma xx. We'll cancel out with that sigma xx, same sort of thing with the yx and the zx. Those will all cancel out. And then the other terms will actually add together. So you'll see this d sigma xx dx times a 1 half dx dy dz. And then here we have a minus, the same thing over here, but there's a minus sign here. So they'll add together. So you can simplify this big expression here, and you'll get the expression that I'm going to highlight in yellow here now. So you'll get that kind of expression when you simplify it. So those are the surface forces in the x direction. And then, like I said before, you can do the same thing in the y direction, in the z direction, and you'll get the expressions just below it. So here's in the y direction, here's in the z direction. So these are the sum of the forces in the x, y, and z directions just due to surface effects. And then of course we also have um, body forces that would have to take into account. So the body force, let me write it over here, body force in the x direction would be like the density times the volume. That gives me the mass times the body force, or the let's say the acceleration due to gravity in that direction, gx. We can do the same thing in the y direction. 
and then you can do the same idea in the z direction. So I'm just assuming that the body force is just due to gravity. In general, you could have body forces due to electromagnetic effects, for example. A whole study of fluid motion with electromagnetic effects is called magnetohydrodynamics, or MHD for short, magnetohydrodynamics. We're not going to get into that. So gravity is our only body force here. So now we have our surface forces in the x-direction, our body forces in the x-direction. So sum of the forces is equal to the mass times uh, the acceleration. So the mass of the cube, we just said a moment ago, was just density times the volume. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do mass times the acceleration in the x-direction is equal to the sum of the forces in the x-direction. So the mass will be the density times the volume. The acceleration of the fluid element we talked about in a previous lecture. This is the Lagrangian derivative of the x velocity component. That will give us the x acceleration. So the Lagrangian derivative of the x velocity component. That's my acceleration in the x direction. And then some of the forces in the x direction we have, I'll just copy what we have up above. d sigma xx dx plus d sigma yx dy plus d sigma zx dz. Um, oops, and then that whole thing is multiplied by dx dy dz. And then we have our body force term. You know what, I'm going to run out of space, so let me put that just below. So there's our F equals MA expression. Well, you can see here the dx dy dz's will cancel out from each of the terms. And so then what we're left with, I'm just doing this in the x direction here, is the following. So there you go, there's the momentum equation in the x direction. And you can do the same idea for the y and z directions as well. We'll just focus on the x direction just because it'd be busy if I did the y and z directions as well. But if you look at this for a moment, you'll see over on the left hand side we have what looks like a mass times an acceleration. It's really mass times acceleration per unit volume because the density is mass per unit volume. Um, that's mass times acceleration per unit volume is equal to the surface forces per unit volume plus the body forces per unit volume. So it's just F equals MA. That's all the momentum equations are. If we expanded the Lagrangian derivative, just to expand that out, it'll be rho times dux dt, the Eulerian derivative, plus the convective derivative component. Just a lot to write down here. So there's the, in square brackets there, that's the acceleration. And then of course we have the surface forces term. And then we have the body force term. So there is our momentum equation in the x direction. So momentum equation in x direction. And of course, again, you can do this in the y direction, in the z direction as well. It's kind of a complicated looking equation, but conceptually it's pretty straightforward. It's just F equals MA, where we've made use of the Lagrangian derivative to get the acceleration and to get the forces. The body force term is pretty easy. The surface forces I've just written in terms of stresses here. Now, as it stands, these momentum equations, you know, there, there are a lot of unknown variables in here. You know, you've got velocities, here, you know, a bunch of velocity components and stress components. You know, there are a lot of unknowns here. We'll simplify it a little bit further in the next lecture. In the next lecture, what we'll do is we'll rewrite these stress terms on the right-hand side in terms of velocities. And that's what we call a stress-strain rate constitutive relation, it's something I talked about at the beginning of this lecture. Uh, and we'll do it specifically for a Newtonian fluid. That kind of relationship between stresses and strain rates um, it'll vary depending on the type of fluid you deal with. So for example,
you have I ideal gases. That's the way certain that that's a relationship between pressure and density and temperature for a certain class of gases. Not all gases are ideal, okay? Only a certain subset of gases are ideal. Newtonian fluids um, have a certain behavior and the stresses and strain rates behave in a certain manner, right? Remember that when we talk about Newtonian fluids, we have the shear stress is equal to the dynamic viscosity times the velocity gradient. That's a constitutive relationship that relates stresses and strain rates. Strain rate is just like a velocity derivative or velocity gradient. That's what I should have said. Uh, stress related to velocity gradient. That's our stress strain rate constitutive relation. So we'll substitute in for those stresses so that they're in terms of velocity gradients and then plug those into these um, stress terms here. And we'll do it but that, that stress strain rate relationship that we'll use will be specifically for Newtonian fluids because water and air are both Newtonian. Many, com many fluids that we deal with in engineering are Newtonian. Um, so we'll just write it specifically for those kinds of fluids. Now there are many non-Newtonian fluids that behave differently and their stress strain rate relationship would look different. And to get uh, the equivalent of the Navier-Stokes equations for those kinds of fluids, what you would need to do is get that stress strain rate relationship and plug it in here and then you get kind of the form for those non-Newtonian fluids. But we're not going to worry about that here. We're just going to deal with Newtonian fluids. And again, that'll be in the next lecture. All right, I think I've said everything I need to about the mo momentum equations. Um, make sure you take a look at the next lecture and you'll see how we simplify this to the Navier-Stokes equations. And then with the Navier-Stokes equations, we can actually start solving uh, some uh, flow fields for Newtonian fluids, some very um, useful kinds of flow fields. So we'll do that in the next lecture.